Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of the future of imaging of pancreatic cancer, from cinematic rendering to radiomics to deep learning. And in part one, I focused mainly on cinematic rendering, and in part two, I'm going to pick up a little bit on cinematic rendering in terms of display, and then we're going to look at radiomics and deep learning. One of the things we do now, I mentioned with 3D imaging, is we're still looking at things on a monitor, which perhaps limits our ability to truly see things in 3D because it's a flat monitor. One of the things that's come along recently is the HoloLens 2 from Microsoft that's being used in a number of different fields. Now, in terms of radiology, Robert Schneider from Siemens presented some work in uh, going back a couple of years now with cinematic rendering, combining it with this um, virtual reality for enhanced visualization. And we are looking at this now at Hopkins, seeing if this can benefit us in understanding different tissue and different tissue types, but also for preoperative planning. In my mind, where HoloLens would fit in is a surgeon would be able to look at the case and get a better understanding of specifically what they're looking at. So I'll just show you a couple examples. With the HoloLens, the images are literally sitting in your hand. And here you can see I'm looking at the liver and under the liver, I'm showing you the ribs, the portal vein, the left kidney. And I'm just creating a series of images that I'm able to move and cut through and manipulate on the fly. And here's a few more images. And you can see uh, on the image on the bottom right, how that image is literally floating in the middle of my lab. You can see the reflections off the, uh, the, off the lighting, but you can see how my fingers are controlling how large the image is, what part of the images I'm cutting through, what I'm looking at, and what I'm rotating. And you can see even on these static images, you really get a feel of the three-dimensionality of the data set, but imagine wearing the glasses, it kind of blows you away what you're able to see. And again, the ability to cut through and do everything when it's in your hand, once you get used to the motion, one of the things you have to really learn is how to use the HoloLens because everything, uh, in theory, it's going to be voice command, but right now everything we've done is really with hand commands. So you need how to pinch your fingers to move things closer, to expand, to take a picture. Everything can be done bet between touching one hand or the other, but it takes a while to get used to it. And here's where I've created the 3D imaging showing you the vessels, nicely showing you the uh, accessory right hepatic off the SMA. But again, this set of images is done to optimize the visualization of the vessels. And you can imagine for preoperative planning how valuable this could be. Again, you can see my hand is there and I'm taking a picture with my hand in the picture. Again, just simply showing what specifically I'm seeing through the uh, imaging technique. Now, I think that this whole idea about doing this virtual reality is going to be very, very important. Now, in order for cinematic rendering to prosper with or without the HoloLens, I think we're going to need more clinical studies that measure outcomes with and without cinematic rendering. We need more clarity into the variability of image quality and its impact on its clinical utility, which means I can make really good images. Can you? And can we have those images constant from patient to patient and from site to site? Clinical studies comparing radiologist accuracy with and without cinematic rendering is important. And clinical studies looking at end user impact of studies, whether it impacts the surgeon's decision making, the oncologist's decision making, whether it impacts whether or not to operate, and if you operate, does it impact how we do the specific surgery. So with future directions with cinematic rendering, I think AI is going to be critical to help optimize the study visualizations. I think AI is going to be also important for detecting findings hidden within these complex data sets. I think better visualization, this augmented reality, going with the HoloLens by Microsoft, but perhaps going beyond there. One challenge with the HoloLens, of course, the uh, pair of lens costs about $3,500 to $4,000, and it's hard to buy a lot of those. So some of the things I'm sure Microsoft will come up with in the near term will be cheaper. I know there's lots of work going on in Apple and going on in Facebook 
and by the end of 2022 both of them should have reasonably priced which means two to four hundred dollars of these um, glasses for um, virtual reality and again we need more tools it needs to be something that's a bit easier to do and we also need to be able to uh, change the display of the cinematic in real time when you're doing the hololens display as well okay let's leave radiomics and visualization and let's move over to radiomics radiomics is something you're seeing a lot about in the literature is radiomics for ct and now radiomics for ultrasound and now radiomics for mr everyone is using radiomics for detecting disease staging disease predicting response to therapy predicting outcome it's amazing the number of articles now the challenge of course is the articles uh, have limited size sample sets they also are from single institutions and a lot of the problem with radiomics will works well clearly at Hopkins based on their parameters may now work from a different site so one of the things that needs to be done with radiomics is to make it more into a more robust science but when you think about radiomics from the beginning it does make sense why it would be important radiomics refers to the extraction of mineable high dimensional data from radiology images and has been applied with within oncology to improve diagnosis prognostication with the aim of delivering precision medicine the premise is that imaging data convey meaningful information about tumor biology behavior and pathophysiology and may reveal information that is not otherwise apparent to current radiologic and clinical interpretation and in this article by sure this is a very good article published a few months ago in radiographics i think it's worthwhile looking at and you can see how they talk about the chart from clinical data collection to image acquisition and transfer image prep annotation feature extraction feature selection model validation performance of validation all of the steps that are necessary in many things but especially in radiomics in radiomics we talk about different features we talk about shape we talk about first order features including mean median and mode we talk about image texture which is something that i spent a lot of time speaking to you about with the cinematic rendering and we talk about all sorts of filters that can be applied to data there is almost an infinite number of filters tank that can be used the question is what filters will help us to better recognize disease and better understand what we're doing at once the clinical and radiomic data is collected and curated statistical models are fitted to predict study endpoints such as tumor type or survival time uh, sure goes on to say a typical model uses input features in addition to target data that the model aims to predict such as benign versus malignant or risk of recurrence the final performance and generalizability of models discovered from a radionomic radiomic analysis is determined by validating the model on new test data so the last sentence is the bottom line just because it works in my site will it work at your site if it works on one set of data will it work on the second set of data can it be transferable from institution to institution at the current time this often is where things fail one of the challenges you have is you have your own data but it's very hard to share data because of hipaa regulations and everything else so a lot of work is being done perhaps federated computing will be the solution to this problem now in radiomics if you look at the applications that people have been using including ourselves uh, detection classification and prognostication are the typical things now if we look a little bit more carefully at radiomics radiomics is the high throughput extraction analysis of quantitative features for medical images extraction of quantifiable imaging markers and application of these markers for again predicting everything with radiomics is taking what we've done already learning from it and then trying to predict as we look at more cases when you think about tumors their heterogeneous structures heterogeneity can be quantified on imaging data 
and radiomics can convert this data into highly dimensional mindable feature space. Now, of course, it also means that you have the spectrum of a disease process. Remember what looks necrotic, for example, and what looks heterogeneous is dependent on your protocol. Sometimes the non contrast can be good, sometimes arterial can be good, sometimes venous can be good. Perhaps all three of them can be valuable, but how do you weigh them and things look different depending if you give contrast, the timing of the contrast delivery, and the rate of injection all become very important. Now, radiomics converts medical images such as CT scans into data that can be used for prognosis. In this article by Park, they make the point about the problem of reproducibility, okay? That's very, very important. And as I've said, if you don't have reproducibility, you're gonna have all sorts of problems. Now, a little closer look at what things you could measure. Uh, when we did a couple of our papers, we looked at 500 or so features. It ended up that 50 were probably important. And, and you did really well by looking at maybe five of them, not as good as looking at 50. But again, one of the things we'll realize is you probably don't need to look at everything, but you need to look at the right thing. So we'll get back to that. So radiomics features can be classified into first order, shape, second order, and higher order statistical outputs. First order being the distribution of individual voxel values, which is the simplest thing. Histogram-based methods, mean, median, maximum, minimum, and such measurements as uniformity, entropy, skewness, and kurtosis are all things we can look at. We look at first order statistics and you can see some of the variability and how we can use that for prediction models. We look at shape, compactness, maximum diameter, spherical disproportion, sphericity, surface area, surface to volume ratio, volume. You can see these are features you typically do not look at yourself, but within the computer program, they can look at it, quantitate it, and use it. We talk about second order statistics, which are texture features, statistical relationships between voxels, gray level co-occurrence matrix, gray level run length matrix, are some of the things you can look at, and you can use that again as a prediction model. We then talk about higher order statistics, filter grids to extract repetitive or non-repetitive patterns, wavelength. We could talk about Laplacian and Gaussian filters to smooth the image or detect the edge of the image. And again, trying to use that to create a signature. If you think about it for a second, what you're trying to do with radiomics is create a signature for a specific tumor type or whatever you're looking at. You want signatures. You want it to be like a fingerprint. That's what you're really trying to do. So when we did our initial work, this is by Linda Chu, we looked at 478 radiomics features from CT scans of uh, uh, patients, uh, both normal with, as well as patients with pancreatic cancer. And you could see that if you look at this slice which has a cancer on it, you're looking at two different patterns with radiomics. Image on your left is a normal renal donor, on your right is a patient with pancreatic cancer. And you can see there's some similarity but substantial difference. When we looked at 40 radiomics features out of the nearly 500 for our random forest classifier, you can see our accuracy for detecting tumor. Now with radiomics, you said there's a tumor in the pancreas. It wasn't localizing the tumor, but accuracy of 99.2%, sensitivity 100%, specificity 98.5%. Now those are indeed impressive numbers. And just to show you, we went from 40 features to five features, you still were in the 90 to 95% range. So again, what were the key features? Texture, shape, and wavelets were all key features. And here's the article Linda Chu and our entire team wrote with Bert Vogelstein and Ken Kinsler and Alan Yuley just a couple of years ago. Now in that article, our results showed that after manual segmentation of the pancreas boundaries, radiomics features in the random forest classifier were highly accurate in differentiating cancer from normal controls. So again, very, very high accuracy. We were very successful in that regard. And we did make the point, of course, that CT features of early cancer can be missed. Now imagine if you had radiomics on every case and it gave you this accuracy. Now, it's not gonna tell you where the tumor is, 
that's where deep learning will come in. But even if someone just said to you, Elliot, there's a cancer here with 99% accuracy, can you find it? Most of the time, I think I'll find the lesion. But, you know, it would be so helpful to know there's really a cancer present there. You can imagine how helpful that would be. We know there's technical hurdles to overcome. Other people have been trying to do similar work with variable success. But I think the concept is really good and radiomics simply needs to be improved. That's what needs to be done. Again, we mentioned limitations. Everyone has the same limitation. It's from a single institution, single vendor, set protocols. What happens with other vendors? What happens with other protocols? All of that becomes important, and that's why we need better rules for sharing. I know HIP is important, and I'm not going to discuss that, but we need to figure out the ways of being able to share data. One thing COVID taught us is if you want to survive a pandemic, you need to share. Rules fall apart because you need to get things done. Can you imagine one of the reasons a vaccine took 10 years, not one year in the past, was because there was no sharing of data. And here from day one, there were lots of sharing. And I think that's a lesson that we could take from there for all of us. Now, in terms of survival, this was a recent article by Linda Chu and Cian Park, making the point that addition of CT radiomics features to standard clinical factors improve survival prediction in patients with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And that becomes very important, the survival time and status uh, in the validation cohort were determined by majority voting based on the trained trees. So it was something that could be done. I don't want to go into specific details of the top 10 features that were used for making this prediction, but at the end of the day, the idea that addition of radiomics can help improve outcome predictions becomes very important. Now, we're not changing the outcome of the patient with this method, but we're better able to tell a patient how they're going to do, and that becomes very important in the management of patients. And what patients obviously, what is their first question they typically ask? And here's just some of the charts from that article, and I'll let you look at that on your own time, but you can get a good feel of what we're able to do and why I believe and we believe that radiomics is so important. Uh, and again, you could imagine taking this algorithm and combining it with other biomarkers, pathology and genetic biomarkers, and you can imagine how good a prediction model you might be able to come up with. We also published previously looking at autoimmune pancreatitis and distinguishing from pancreatic cancer with radiomics features. Remember, that's one of the more difficult diagnoses. The overlap between uh, autoimmune pancreatitis and cancer is high. It's not uncommon for patients to go to surgery, get a Whipple's procedure, which ends up being autoimmune pancreatitis. So can we do better? Uh, when we look at radiomics, although we know there's a, the radiologists are best 75% accurate by looking at different features and trying to use the radiomics, we're trying to do better than the radiologist. Because obviously the key between autoimmune pancreatitis, which is conservative management with steroids versus cancer and oncology uh, therapy, obviously the stakes are indeed very, very high. AIP was suspected or included in the differential diagnosis of the CT reports in 47% of cases. When we look at radiomic analysis of AIP versus pancreatic cancer, the sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy was around 95%, so it was substantially better. And again, that be had tremendous potential treatment uh, impact. You can imagine, again, looking at every patient with the pancreas with radiomics. Is there a tumor present? What's going on? And in the cases with autoimmune pancreatitis, often the radiologist doesn't think of it, the surgeon doesn't think of it, no one thinks of it, but now hopefully the computer can think of it. And again, radiomics features help differentiate autoimmune pancreatitis from pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma with an accuracy of 95.2%. Indeed, very, very important. Um, people have also used, here's an example of using radiomics features for looking at the SMA for determining involvement with pancreatic cancer. So it's pre-surgical planning. And again, this radiomics model was very good. 
Here's an example of where radiomics was used um, for evaluation of neuroendocrine tumors. Our data indicated that texture parameters have potential in grading neuroendocrine tumors, particularly in differentiating G1, G2 from G3. So again, very important in that regard. And here's simply one of the graphs from the paper by Shunigan looking at this process. Now, limitations of texture analysis, limitations of radiomics, scan of variability, scan parameter variability, type of reconstruction algorithm used, all become very important. Now, in our mind, of course, we think radiomics needs to be part of the entire process. And so, why don't we take a break there and let me finish up with part three and tell you where we go from radiomics into deep learning and AI and what we've been doing in that regard and where I think things are going. I'll be right back. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.